I despise alarm clocks. They have always felt like a punch in my face out of the blue. I reached for the alarm clock and turned it off. I opened my eyes. Everything was blurry. The light was hurting my eyes. Here I was, lying with a hangover, looking at the pillow next to me and last night's mess. A red dress was left on the chair. I remembered that from some place last night. Where? I couldn't tell. What the fuck was I doing again? The alarm clock sounded annoying once more, on my phone this time. Where did I leave it? Damn it, I have to get up now. I got up with a grin on my face and headed to the living room. There it was, lying on the floor. I bowed and turned the phone off. Lisa would go crazy. I didn't care. I moved on to the kitchen, turned the coffee machine on and stepped into the shower. What was I doing last night? How long am I going to make excuses for one last time? I enjoyed the hot water on my body, washing me of whatever happened. It doesn't count as long as you don't remember it. After all, there is no reality but only various points of view. I got out and got the coffee that was waiting for me. I looked through the window. Window, window on the wall. Which one is the blindest of them all? There was too much light. I never liked that either, so I turned around as soon as I heard the phone ringing. 6.58. Silence was shattered again by Lisa's annoying voice, leaving messages. And then Lisa again reminding me of my schedule. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to kill her or thank her for putting up with me. I left my cup on the table and went back to the bedroom. I stood there. My tuxedo was thrown on the floor, that beautiful red dress lying on the chair and blood on the seats. Lisa's voice on the answering machine went on telling names, appointments and all that boring things that were paying for our acceptable way of existence. I leaned on the wall. Lights, alcohol and a smile were the only things I could recall. I stepped into the closet, picked a random suit of clothes, I dressed and got one last sip of coffee on my way out. I could do the ride with a blindfold on my eyes if I had to. Half my brain was still shut down due to an awful migraine. I parked next to Lisa's car and checked the time. I was late. Again. A sigh came out, as if it was last night's faded memories. Hadn't it been for her being in love, she would never put up with me and my mess. She was nothing but loyalty wearing love's mask. She was smart enough to get in on time. She would never become a lover, so she was giving her best shot to become a necessity, secretly hoping to transform herself into a loved one. She was like a walking crime on stilettos. I reached for the elevator. I got in and pressed the button. Loyalty. That luring bitch. She was loyal. And I was too. Not the way she had always been wishing for. It made me wonder from time to time, if she had the whole picture, would she ever pick up the same cards to play with me? Tasteless elevator music always makes me think random crap like that. Finally, I arrived at my floor. A few more steps and here I am, at my office. What is really an office? What's wrong with me? My migraine kept getting worse and I kept on thinking crappy thoughts as I felt my vertigo's breath on my forehead. Lisa was waiting for me at the door. She wanted desperately to come as early as possible so that she would be the first I would talk with daily. She was possessive in every invisible breath of her. That would get her fired one day but now she was waiting for me with another cup of coffee on one hand and my notes on the other. No, today wouldn't be that day either. Once she doesn't make time for that coffee, she's out, 
back to her meaningless life that she looks down to, and that's how her genes will be removed from the gene pool. I took the coffee and the notes and stepped into my office while I kept talking to myself in order to keep going. There was no office, actually. I only had two insanely expensive, comfortable black armchairs, white walls and a small coffee table. The last one was my only compromise. After all, I needed to put my cup of coffee somewhere. I sat on the chair, left the cup on the table and stretched my body while I was trying to make my migraine's aura disappear. Seven minutes left before my first appointment enters. This wasn't really a job. Since there are people willing to pay for my expenses and taxes, I guess it's okay. But what I was really doing was nothing more, nothing less, than playing with people. People, as they grow older, seem to forget how to play and to be played. They get bored of buying things. People, relationships, careers, achievements, whatever seems sparkling enough to their eyes. So here I was, joining their misery in order to play along with them all over again, with signed contracts of secrecy. Sex is cheap nowadays. Bodies come always with their price on them. At least for the ones who keep on paying me. Drugs never fill the void. They die of boredom in their golden chains. So I am here to make their long, impeding death a bit more enjoyable. But mines are a bit more expensive. I play only one game. Hide and seek. You would never guess how much money people are willing to pay to be found among their shadows and their darkness. I looked at the black carpet beneath my feet, shaped as a hat. I smiled as my aura was stretching more than my body. Here I was, their beloved Mad Hatter. What kind of travel could intimidate yet tempt people who'd already tried every known kind of tripping? No other but be seen instead of being exposed. Blind people who can't see, but long for to be seen. I love humans' irony. Alex Smith Age 47 Musician Type 1 diabetes Single Fallen star I always believed that whenever a profile didn't fit in a post-it note, then it wasn't complete. I was watching him entering the room, sitting on the armchair, staring at me as if there was a smoking glass between us. I could see with his eyes. He saw people as spinning dots of color. For a moment, I wondered if I should change my color rotation to say hi, but then I changed my mind. There was no hurry. After all, he didn't really want to give it a try. All that he wanted was to go home, lie down, and die slowly in his misty misery. Whose blood is on your hands? I asked him. People with type 1 diabetes tend to hide their fingers so that you don't take notice of the damage done by the needles. I never made questions to get answers. I was simply watching their thoughts. Every one of them pictures himself in the center of an imaginary house that stands for what he really is, what he loves and fears, what he treasures more. A shelter and a sanctuary at the same time, where they hide all that is sacred to them. There he was, sitting on the armchair playing with his fingers, avoiding me as I was looking backwards through his eyes. In his mind, he was squatting with his head looking at the floor. Everything around was black but for spots of color that were playing in orbits around him. Most people don't know that I'm there, but he lifted his head slowly and looked through me. I started falling in my migraine's aura. I couldn't breathe. He was on me with his hands on my neck, suffocating me. I couldn't hear what he was muttering. I only had a few seconds to get back into his mind before I fainted. I am not like you. I never was. I will never be. That were the only words that I heard from his mouth 
and then nothing. Void. I fainted inside his mind. Most people enjoy water. Me, I need water. There I was in the shower, wearing my clothes, facing the wall while water was dropping on me. A sudden flare sparkled in front of me. Alex was holding me against the wall. I could smell him. Smoke, oranges and cinnamon. Alex, I spoke to myself. Where's Alex? And I opened the shower's door. Why am I with my clothes in the shower? It felt like I was in a car crash. I took my clothes off and let the water do its work. I had the feeling that I had more blackouts than I realized so far. Fewer hours daily were my own. If other people's thoughts weren't able to drive me insane, my own mind could do that effortlessly. I stepped out of the shower, dried myself and got dressed in a total black outfit. Lisa was waiting for me outside with a cup of coffee and a painkiller. I cancelled the rest of the appointments. Next time you should give me at least a short notice before you invite more than scheduled. She turned her back on me and left. I swallowed the pill and went back to my office. It was a mess. Coffee spilled on the floor, the cup crushed under the floor, armchairs lying down. I sat down and closed my eyes. I was looking for Alex. There he was on his stage, standing up this time. He was expecting me. He looked at me. You seem broken, he said. A river of colors floated out of my stomach. I looked back at him. I am Alex. What's your name? You already know. Not that. I want your real name. He started transforming himself and everything around us into mirrors, imprisoning me in a diamond. We weren't alone there. I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned my head. It was Lisa's hand. She scared me. I was back at the office. Alex's assistant called. Alex apologized for what happened and paid for the rest of the program in advance, regardless if you accept him again or not, as a sign of appreciation for your work. Get yourself a present and tomorrow you'll have a day off. She was slowly taking steps back, realizing her mistake. Don't even dare to call me. No excuse is acceptable. I was standing one breath away from her face. One call and the rest of your days will be just days off, I shouted to her. She kneeled in pain on the floor. I love you, she whispered. No, you don't. You can't love anyone apart from yourself, and that's why it's so easy for you to live like that. It's your nature, freak. One day I will leave you. Let's call that day today. I grabbed her and threw her out of the office. I went back to her chair and took her coat and bag and threw them outside. That's it. We are done here. Keep Alex's check as your compensation. I am sorry. Please don't do that. Don't shut me off. Who's going to take care of you? You need me. I snapped the door on her face. <laughs> Arrogance and stupid's hand can be lethal sometimes. I went to the bar and grabbed a bottle of wine. I put it on the table with a glass. It was getting dark outside. I searched for my phone. No clocks were allowed at the office. It's one of my rules. After all, there is no time but scattered snapshots of our limited perception. I had no recollection of morning, noon, and most of the afternoon. My migraine was fading slowly. I felt like I was dying and no one had the nerve to tell me that. All my medical exams were normal, as if they belonged to a younger person. Still, I was constantly exhausted with migraines. Chronic fatigue syndrome was all I got after having paid the bill instead of giving up and going on vacation. Someone was knocking on the door. Lisa told that she had cancelled every appointment. Someone was being stupid. Either Lisa or the unexpected visitor. And I wasn't in the mood of finding out which one. I opened the bottle and poured me some wine. I liked that etiquette. Merlot with an essence of oranges. A black envelope was lying on the floor. 
It seemed like an invitation. I took it and opened it. There was a black card inside, with a haiku written in golden letters. My blood for your blood. Three lies for a fake truth. It's just me and you. The hat. What's that? That must be something from last night. Kate. I remembered the name. No, it was not Kate. I took another painkiller from my drawer and sat down. The hat. Who the hell was the hat? I took the cart back to my office and put the armchairs back to their places. I sat on the opposite chair than I used to. The coffee was still on the floor. My blood for your blood. Three lies for a fake truth. It's just me and you. I kept looking at the broken cup, the chairs, the walls. Then I stood up and moved the armchairs once more and turned the carpet upside down. There it was, a necklace, a gold circle with a platinum triangle in it. I grabbed it in my fist. A frozen wave instantly trickled down my spine, and as a reflex, I turned to face the ceiling. It was changing. Someone whispered in my ear, It's just me and you. I turned around slowly. We were standing on a dock. I took him by surprise. I didn't think that you would have the nerve to do that, he told me, almost irritated. What do you want? I asked, trying to see through his eyes. No, the correct question is, what do you want? Or I would rather say, whom are you searching for? Your problem now is that I don't really care. I only care about what I want, and that's taking back what's mine. You took it, and I let you held it for quite some time, but now I am bored, and I want to play as well. So, coach, are you a bit rusty to become a player once again for all time's sake? I couldn't see anything but the lake beside me, no matter how much I tried to focus, but I could hear him clearly. You might think that's not fair, but life is not fair. Life is balance. I do nothing but to bring the balance back, whether you like it or not. You have done some wonderful work here. I have seen it all. With foolish people, though, I'm not one of them. Tiny, afraid of living, scared of dying, terrified of making love, as the mists they keep shooting between the eyes. He came close and leaned over me, whispering, You are sleeping now. Deep down, you know it. You need that sleep in order to go on doing what you do. It's when you can breathe. That's why I have no recollection of your dreams whatsoever. You can't tell anymore whether you're really awake or not. You don't have a clue. Just give it a thought and then... One more. Let me help you a bit with that thought. He kissed my lips and then one more kiss. A slow, sensual kiss that wouldn't let me breathe. Everything started turning black. I had to focus. I was running out of time. I transformed into him. He let go of me. I fell down. He leaned over me and smiled. Freedom. What a deceitful illusion. In another place or time, I might have even liked you. But you are nothing more than a broken puppet, and I have no time for it. He pushed his hand into my chest. I was dying. Let go. Just give in and you will find peace, I promise. I could no longer see him, but I felt his hand crawling through my chest. Colors starting coming out of my chest as someone forced him to take his hand off. He couldn't move. Alex was behind his back holding him still. I thought I heard his voice screaming in my head. Get out. Now. There I was, lying on the floor barely breathing, with my nose bleeding. The phone was ringing. Breathe in, I thought. Focus and just breathe in and breathe out. The recorded message finished and I listened to Alex's voice speaking with his deep, distinctive voice. I know you are a killer. I knew it from the first moment I sat on that armchair. 
The blood on my hands is yours, but can you really tell whose blood is on your hands? People without names, people without faces, people once lost and never found. Check your facts. He hung up. The facts started printing. My body ached all over. I could hardly stand up. I crawled to take the sheet of paper. A photo of a woman lying down naked with the same necklace I found earlier. Her face wasn't visible on the photograph, so I couldn't tell if I knew her or not. I took the sheet of paper and placed the necklace on top of it. I erased the message from the answer machine and opened the drawer where I kept my medical file. I put it on my desk and poured myself some more wine. It would be a long night. I would either find the answer or pass out again. I opened the hidden closet and got all the files out. The answer may have been hidden in one of those files. As the sun rose hours later, the office was still a mess, but with papers all over the place. I had fallen asleep on the floor. I had lost track of time once more. I woke up and I wasn't certain of where I was, what had happened, what was real and what wasn't. I had a few moments to decide upon that. I got up and made myself some coffee. Coffee and some pills I took out from the sugar can. Alex's file was next to the coffee machine. I must have had left it there last night. All notes were spread. An article with a photo of him back on his days of glory. I took the copy of the article and reached for my cigarettes. I had completely forgotten about that. I lit a cigarette, took the cup of coffee and sat on Lisa's chair. Glorious Alex Gate had stabbed a young stoned groupie backstage after a concert of his. He claimed it was self-defense and checked himself into a mental clinic after donating most of his money at charities. I recalled last night's call. Only a killer would identify a killer with such certainty. I reached for the woman's photo with a necklace and placed it next to the article. Was the woman alive? Was she dead? And how, Alex said that photograph of her, was he there? As questions kept showing up in my head, the room started to fade. There I was, back on that stage. Alex was waiting. He opened his eyes and looked at me. A knife appeared out of nowhere and stabbed me at my shoulder. I started bleeding. You were curious about what happened. That's what happened. I could have chosen her heart, but either I didn't want to kill her, or I didn't want her to die there. Does this answer your questions? As the knife vanished in my hand. I gave you one of my truths. It's your turn now. He transformed the stage into a room. A bright white room with no furniture or any other object. The woman from the photograph was lying down between us. Within a blink of an eye, he stood behind my back, hugging me from behind, whispering. Look at her. Are you absolutely sure that you don't know who this woman is? Tell me her name. Don't you remember her? Let me refresh your memory. The knife appeared once more and stabbed her on the shoulder. I spent seven years in that metal institution checking in and out, over and over again. And I did all that because of you. So I owe you, and you owe me. Tell me her name. There was no name on the article, no photograph of her, no personal information. She was a minor, so the law protected her privacy. I don't know her. This time I will let her bleed to death if you don't give me the truth. I spent years tracking you. I wasn't sure that I had found you until I stared at you. Tell me her name. She's bleeding. Somewhere at this very moment her body dies slowly. I've paid more than enough in order to track her down, not me. You took the money. Now hand her over to me. I'm running out of time. We are both running out of time. And believe me, you have more to lose than me. My senses told me that there was one more person in the room. He was right. I was running out of time. I ran towards her and removed the knife from her wound. I heard someone laughing as he was taking the knife from my wound. I turned to Alex, but he was gone.
returned once more, and I was back in my office. I still hadn't passed out, yet I could tell that it was only a matter of time before that happened again. I got back to Alex's medical file. I found notes reporting him getting in and out of hospitals, along with music recordings and awards. I started writing down the dates since the stabbing. Nothing else, just the numbers. We are not numbers, but fractals of our thoughts, so numbers sometimes help us understand our patterns. I ended up with too many numbers. His assistant gave us copies of everything that happened in his life. Once more, there were too many facts and trivial things. I threw the paper away and went back to Lisa's board. I erased everything and started writing all over again from scratch. The date of the stabbing was the 1st of September. That was seven years ago. I noted every date of these reports on the board. 1st of September, he got arrested. 2nd day of September, he pleads insanity. 3rd day of September, a woman confirmed that it was in self-defense. 5th day of September, he checked in the mental institution. 8th of October, he wins his first award. He wasn't there to receive it. And the numbers went on and on, following him in and out of his madness, while he was turning into a phantom that kept coming back recording, earning ridiculous amounts of money out of his misery. I went back and opened another bottle of wine. I was obviously going crazy bit by bit, and soon wine wouldn't be on the menu. So what were my options? A. Crazy. Or B. Dying. Or C. In prison. Or D. All of the above. I would definitely pick up D. Life grows and dies on her own terms. A flare shot through my mind. I took my glass and got back to the board. One, one, two, three, five, eight. Those weren't random numbers. I was watching a Fibonacci sequence. Alex was building a fractal. That's how he managed to keep on going for that long. I searched for his studies. His studies must be filed somewhere. He studied science in college and got his PhD on brain's electromagnetic fields. He gave up his career in research when he started performing live. I was sitting there exhausted, drinking my wine in silence, watching his fractals evolve through the numbers as if the numbers were keys on a music seat and I was listening to his melody. No, I wasn't dying. That was a false assumption that led nowhere, a system error on a blue screen. I laid my eyes on my medical file. My absolute perfect medical file. No matter how many doctors I visit, no matter how many medical exams I may have, the reports will always suggest the same. I am as healthy as a perfect newborn baby with a clear preference to alcohol instead of milk. Each time you stand on a wrong starting point, it will always lead you on a dead-end path. That's what I used to say a long time ago. So, actually, I am dead. I tried to taste the wine in my mouth. It tasted like nothing. I could feel it in my mouth, but I couldn't taste it. I spit it in my hands. I could feel it dripping on my arms. I tried to taste it on my skin once more while staring at the numbers. No taste at all. Where are my angels? Where is the black tunnel with the light? When did I pass the welcome sign at the choirs? Where is hell whatsoever? What was the girl's name? What date is it today? When did I die? I have no recollection of it whatsoever. I was just sitting there with an empty glass of wine in my hand, unable to do anything. No, any thought I had was inaccurate. So I stood up and poured me some more wine while looking once more at the files. At least I had all the time I needed. It's kind of crazy having something like time since it doesn't really exist, but that was the least of my problems for the moment. Which moment? There was no moment, yet I was still there. I took the necklace out of my pocket. What is time? I looked at Alex's fractals. One, one, two, three, five, eight. What is time? Is it a dot, a straight one-way line, a spiral, or something else? What? Was I running out of time, or was I already out of whatever we had ever defined as time? I lit a cigarette and took a step back. Where was I? What was my profession? I opened the drawers. Everything that was placed inside them kept disappearing like dust in the wind. I faced the window trying to see where I was. I couldn't figure it out. I wasn't even sure what I was watching. I could see nothing but three moons. 
Even if I wasn't dead still, I had fainted once more and I was about to die. I had to get out of there. I went to the door. It was locked. I kicked it, but I couldn't break it. I threw a chair to the glass. It fell backwards without causing any damage. I went back to the board. I erased all of the numbers. I drew a circle and a triangle inside and waited patiently on the floor. Still, nothing happened. I was thirsty. I went to the refrigerator. I opened it. There was nothing but bottles of wine and water. I grabbed a bottle of water and tried to open it on my way back to the office. It was so damn hot in there. I moved the bottle close to my lips and felt the cold water soothing my thirst. I could taste it. I spit it at once and threw the bottle away. There is an ancient myth suggesting that when you die, you become thirsty, and as you walk along the way, you find oblivion spring. Once you drink from its water, you forget everything about your previous life, so that you will be able to move on to what's next. I had already forgotten too many things to keep on forgetting more. When did I die? How? My headache was killing me. I am dead. How is that even possible to ache? Unless I am nothing more than a projection, and somewhere my body, or what's left of it, still thinks that it's in pain. I searched for Alex's work on electromagnetic fields. The key must have been hidden somewhere in those notes. I wasn't standing still, not any more. I was moving, yet I couldn't realize the move. Nothing of what my mind perceived was real. It was here just to let me free my mind and let me bend what didn't exist. Time's illusion. I started studying his notes like a student who was running late for semester's exams. The brain is the receiver of the electromagnetic fields. The basic generator is always the heart. All I had to do is change the frequency of vibrations. I touched my heart. Nothing was moving inside. No frequency here. So my real heart must have stopped. I went to the refrigerator and took one more bottle of water out. He was right. Let go. Just give in and you will find peace, I promise, he said. I put the bottle on the table and placed the necklace next to it. A perfect gold circle and its reflection were laying before me. I lied the bottle down and started spinning it. I was turning tables in nowhere's land while watching the water dripping out bit by bit. Sometimes all you need is a leap of faith. I wasn't spinning the bottle. I wasn't spinning oblivion either. It was me who was spinning. Somewhere, a beating heart was still a part of what I used to be. At least I hoped so. All I needed is to find it and change its frequency. I would either kill it or find my way out of here. Was I a killer after all? I had the choice to stop the battle and move on. I would go anywhere to find you. Anywhere, and I would bring you back with me where you belong. A black figure appeared into the room. I wasn't afraid, but I couldn't see the face. I couldn't remember the name. I kept the bottle spinning, but now faster. The shadow kneeled on the ground. Balance. Never forget that. Be gentle like a caress and strong like loyalty. The bottle was floating on air and drops of water were falling over us. The drops kept going through the shadow that seemed like vanishing. It's not a goodbye. It will never be, he whispered into my mind before disappearing as I was turning the water into fire. Everything started burning while liquid fire kept falling all over the place. I smiled as I watched me burning and everything turned into black. Catch me. I know you can, or let me vanish. I won't get one more round. The triangle is the circle. It's not me bending. It's time. Still not breathing. Charge it. One last time. I was in pain. Ready. Stay clear. What was happening? I felt a sudden pain, way worse than before. I screamed while someone was falling on the floor next to me. We got one more back. Someone should shut down that crazy one. Those experiments will kill them all one day. I don't care if you're all crazy. Next time I won't even try to bring them back. I will sign the death certificates and then resign and live on vacation at a place where people live and die once. And then I lived happily ever after. The end. Mark. That was definitely Mark. No one would ever shout that much and hit so hard. I was at the lab. He kept on giving me fluids and drugs while shouting on everybody. I almost loved him for giving me the proper drugs regardless of the fact that he was furious. 
I turned my head towards his voice. I couldn't speak. I felt too weak and in pain despite what he was doing. People were moving me on a stretcher, but someone stopped them before they take me out of the room. What did you see? Tell me now before you forget all about it. Your brain will delete most of it until they let you go. Tell me. Dr. Cage. That wasn't his real name, but none was using his real one anymore but for the formal meetings. He was Alex some time before. You are a killer. That's what I saw and you already know that. And you saw that I am a killer and that's why you signed me up for this. But I am done with it now. No more experiments. I will no longer be your lab rat. Find a new one. I quit. You need some rest. Take that rest and we will talk tomorrow. This is yours. You earned it. He handed me the necklace. A truth for a truth. You still owe that to me, he told me as I was taken outside of the room.